Now recently I did a video on the 2004 French Grand Prix, detailing how Ferrari strategists managed to swap Schumacher onto a four-stop strategy, catch out Renault and win the race on a track that is mighty hard to overtake at. And also having to deal with the tyre war at the time which had Michelin and Bridgestone fighting against each other, with Michelin being good in some places, Bridgestone in others. And I also said in that video that there weren't that many French Grand Prix to write home about, as the races tended to be processional affairs due to the many course circuit being a test track that got used for racing, much like Barcelona, which also offers up racing that isn't exactly great, even in that era of smaller, narrower cars compared to the monsters that are being used today. If you do say stuff like that, people are quick to point out the 1999 French Grand Prix, which did have a tiny bit more going on than I remember at the time. The 1999 French Grand Prix took place on the 27th of June that year, just two weeks before the season changing race at Silverstone that I looked at a few weeks ago. In between the Canadian Grand Prix that was before and this Grand Prix, most of the teams arrived early to take advantage of some testing, which was pretty common at that time. Two days of testing was conducted, with Irvine being the fastest man, followed by Coulthard, with Hakkinen and Schumacher being a little off the pace of their number twos. The only two teams not present were Arrows, who were doing some straight line testing at Santapod, and Minardi, who were testing elsewhere. And as I've said before, I think it might have been in that 2004 French Grand Prix video, teams would test a lot, especially the big teams, because, well, they could afford it. Estoril, Jerez and Barcelona were popular due to the good weather. Ferrari had their own private test track at Fiorano to play with, as well as owning Mugello, where they could do anything extra that they needed to do. But if they had to, the other circuits were always available, with Williams and McLaren able to do something similar. Meanwhile, the likes of Jordan and a couple of smaller teams would often club together to rent somewhere like Silverstone for a couple of days, while Prost, back when it was Ligier, had a key under the carpet for Manicure. Maybe a video on testing is needed, because the money spent must have been mental. So the testing time ended, and it was straight into the nitty gritty of the race weekend. Testing became the first free practice session where all the teams went out to do some running except for one, Ferrari. Maybe they were so confident with the data gathered from testing they felt they didn't need to go out, but the actual reason for not participating isn't something that I've been able to find. Some put it down to, well we were fastest in testing so we should be fastest here, no point in going out, save a bit of cash. Ferrari was leading the Constructors' Championship to McLaren 55-46, which isn't a big gap since an 11 point deficit could be overhauled in the constructors very easily, even under the old 10-6-4-3-2-1 system. Hakkinen meanwhile had just a 4 point lead over Schumacher, so while Ron Dennis's McLaren went out again in practice to go over everything with the utmost diligence possible because Ron Dennis's McLaren, Ferrari was sitting around not doing much by comparison. In the second session though, they did go out, with Schumacher topping the timing sheets and Irvine in second ahead of the two McLarens, Zanardi and Frentzen. It was a hot day on that Friday, and nobody really did anything to set the world on fire that afternoon because the conditions were, well, they were what they were. The Saturday, however, was completely different. During that session, it rained and the order was shaken up a bit as different cars went out at different times, so once again the times aren't exactly indicative of pace. Such was the messed up session from the messed up weather, Barrichello in the Stewart went fastest ahead of Coulthard, who led Hakkinen, Ralph, Irvine, Michael, the two Jordans of Frentzen and Hill, Sonides Williams and Zonta's BAR. For qualifying, the rain didn't stop. 60 minutes with each driver allowed 12 total laps, in and out laps counted. So in effect this translated to 4 hot laps if they go out, do a lap and then come back in again. And because it was raining, much like it had done at the previous year's Austrian Grand Prix, Rubens Barrichello took the second pole position of his career and the first for the Stewart team that he was driving for at the time. Second and third were made up of the two French drivers on the grid, Alesi in the Sauber and Panis in the Prost, with employees from Peugeot packing the stands. The rest of the top six was made up of Coulthard, Frentzen and Schumacher. Hakkinen was down in 14th. Barrichello also won a Rolex, part of a deal he'd made with team boss Jackie Stewart. So a second career pole, first for his team, and a free watch. Not a bad day out. And because of the conditions, five drivers didn't make the cut as part of the 107% rule. Those drivers being Damon in the Jordan, Genet and Bedeau in the Minardis, and the two arrows of Pedro De La Rosa and Tarana Suki Takagi. Hill's margin to the cutoff was just 0.003 of a second, which is the closest anyone has ever been under the cutoff. They were allowed to race because the FIA had seen their practice times and deemed them competitive enough to start the race. 
The track was dry for the start, but compared to Friday, it was much cooler with temperatures in the 18 degrees Celsius range, with the track temperature just 20 degrees. When the five lights went out, Barakala managed to convert his pole while Coulthard got ahead of Panis to slot in behind a lazy. Hakkinen passes on to like he was standing still off the line and then started to make use of his superior McLaren to blast past everybody who was in the way, going from 14th to 9th by the end of the second lap and managing to overtake three cars around the outside of the Adelaide hairpin that was Manny Kaur's main overtaking zone. On lap 5, the Lord of Sisu was on the Michaels gearbox and got past him no issue whatsoever, but the McLaren was set up more towards a dry bias setup, while the Ferrari was set up for the rain that was coming. Maybe McLaren was going to take advantage of what dry conditions they had to gain up as much time as possible, and it looked like it was working. But the question was, what kind of disadvantage would it have versus the Ferrari once the rain came? In the midst of all this, Coulthard had managed to get ahead of Barrichello, and with Michael and Mika struggling, it looked like this was David's race for the taking. But his alternator packed in on lap 10 and the Stewart was back in the lead. Behind, Hakkinen dealt with Frentzen on lap 12, Alesi on lap 19, and then set after Barrichello, who was just 4 seconds up the road. And then the rain started to fall. As soon as it started to come down, Irvine was in the right place on track to take advantage of a pit stop, but the whole process took 43 seconds because Ferrari wasn't ready for him, and in the confusion they'd initially put some dry tyres on his car, so they had to take off the dries and put the wets on. Which I guess is better than having only three tyres ready, right? Right? Foreshadowing is a wonderful mechanic. All the leaders pitted on the next lap, with Barrichello, Hakkinen, Alesi, Frentzen and Panis in. Barrichello rejoined in the lead ahead of the McLaren while Frentzen was stationary for a long time, as Jordan was filling his tank to complete the remaining 44 laps or so. Everybody else was still on a two-stop strategy. Frentzen got out just in front of Michael, which today would have seen him busted for an unsafe release, but in that pit lane nearly every release is unsafe given how tightly compacted it is. Part of the reason they don't go there anymore. Conditions got so bad they had to deploy the safety car, which leads me into another piece of useless trivia, that the 1997 Belgian Grand Prix had started behind the safety car in lesser conditions than the 1998 race started in. Crazy stuff, but there was so much standing water and spray, it was the only thing they could do. And after the 13 car pileup at Spa the previous year, you know, Schumacher running into Coulthard, Fisichella going to the back of one of the Minardis, it was the safest thing they could do. Something that was later confirmed when Villeneuve, Wurtz, Genet and Zanardi all spun behind the safety car. A lazy had already spun off and Fisichella managed to catch his spin. The safety car was out for about 11 laps or so, and when it came in, racing continued and everybody got around safely. Three laps later on lap 38, Hakkinen tried to lob it inside Barrichello but lost traction on the inside kerbing, which sent his McLaren spinning and dropped him to 7th. Now that the Michaels car suited the conditions he could get a stomp on and was lapping about half a second faster than everybody around him. He dispatched with everybody up to Frentzen and then had to go wheel to wheel with Barrichello, with Rubens able to outpower the Ferrari on the exit of the hairpin to maintain his lead. But Michael was being an absolute monster on the brakes and managed to clear the Stewart and go off into clean air, pulling out a decent lead and looking like he'd take the win after Mika's earlier mistake. But the lead then evaporated down from about 9 seconds to tenths. Michael was having gear selection issues. Frentzen had also had this same problem but managed to get the system working again, but Michael's problem was a bit more severe and took him longer to get you know, working. Eventually, he got it fixed just as the field caught up to him, and he was able to build another lead of about 8 seconds or so until his stop, where he took fresh tyres, fuel and a new steering wheel to see if that would cure the issue. So after all of this mayhem, the order was now Barrichello, Frentzen and Hakkinen. Micah's black and silver McLaren was starting to fill the bright yellow Jordan's mirrors, but while Micah and Ruben still needed to make another stop, Frentzen didn't. So when the Stewart and McLaren pitted, Frentzen took the lead. Schumacher's issues slowed him down enough that his brother Ralph was able to overtake him, while Irvine was prevented from overtaking due to team orders so that Michael could maximise his points haul. Frentzen won the race by 11 seconds from Micah, with Barrichello taking the final podium spot. Ralph was 4th ahead of the Michael in 5th and Irvine completing the top 6 points paying positions. Panis, who started 3rd, was 8th, and Damon Hill had pretty much ended his career with this race as his electrical system went on lap 31, and comments made about the team and the car kind of put the nails in the coffin for him, along with his already shredded mental health at the time. But I'll need to do a video on all that because it's a much bigger picture than it seemed as a 8 year old kid. Meanwhile, at the bottom here, Takagi was disqualified for wrong tyres. 
the tyres were marked for use by Della Rosa, which would have meant that Takagi would have had an extra set of tyres available for the race weekend, which was against the rules. Quite a bizarre disqualification, that one. Not something you see every day. Maybe there's a video idea there too. Bizarre disqualifications. Frentzen was over the moon with his win. Jordan's gamble had paid off, and to have a win after two not-so-fun years at Williams, he'd now added to his tally. And I've done a video on that, actually, about how his time at Williams wasn't as good as people thought it was going to be, and what factors made it that way. It was Jordan's second win in the team's history, and would go on to win two more. One later in 1999 at Monza, and then the 2003 Brazilian Grand Prix. And as another fun fact, the 1999 Italian Grand Prix is the only dry race a Jordan won. As it had been with Spa the previous year, the win was a very popular one for the media, the fans in attendance, and those watching at home. Because everybody was a Jordan fan. Even if you said you weren't, you were. It might have something to do with the scantily clad ladies that EJ had hanging around the cars in the promo shots. Just a, just a bit of, you know, just a guess. Ferrari, meanwhile, was wondering what might have been. Some might think that not going out in the first Friday session might have contributed to the lack of return, but both Schumacher and Irvine admitted that they just were not quick enough in the dry. Schumacher had been rapid once the rain fell, but the gearbox issues ruined the race for him anyway, so for some of these articles that I've been reading online about this particular race saying that Ferrari was complacent or too good to go out in that Friday might be a bit of an overreaction. No gearbox problems and Schumacher might have won the race, or at the very least been second. Maybe. That's one for you to discuss. As it was, Hakkinen's lead went up to 8 points in the driver standings, and Ferrari's lead in the constructors was cut to 6. A couple of weeks later though, would be that season changing race at Silverstone. So then, a look at probably the only French Grand Prix to not be a snooze fest, at least in my lifetime. If it's been a revisit where you've learned something new, then do like the video so I know a good job was done, and for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out. Massive thanks as ever to the kind folk at Patreon, and if you want to help out at a more personal level, there's a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and the F1 Store affiliate link. Or the super thanks if you just want to do a one-off tip. So until next time, I've been Aidan Moore, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.